so <laughs> like would you like a you know chest of drawers with your starter sir that exactly sort of thing. do you want a sofa with your starter yes you want please. a sofa with hey. your starter <laughs> how do you kind of square that circle of taking the right risks uh, so that you don't have those regrets one day no absolutely right um i think it's about most people say that you burn out at about six months in new york but you just melt down and for me it was about six days that was a brilliant jota patel and we're going to be hearing more about her dream and her story her journey to new york in fact in the sunday arrival podcast <laughs> Welcome again to the Someday Arrival podcast. And whether you're just starting out as an emerging leader or you're an experienced and seasoned executive, we're here to help you change lives, make a difference and reach your dream destination. I'm Darren Richards and I'm joined today by Jyoti Patel. Now, normally I would say I'm joined by my co-host, Jyoti Patel, but this is the first of a new season and we're going to meet her as a guest. So hi, Jyoti. Hi, Darren. How are we today? How's New York? So whereabouts are you? Tell us where you are. I'm actually in Jersey City, which is just across from the World Trade Center, and it's a lovely day over here. We've got spring, which is blooming. Uh, the, the rose blossoms or cherry blossoms are about to start, so it's my favorite time of year, actually. Very good. Well, Jyoti, you are a woman of many hats. Uh, you are bridging the creative arts and TV and media, as well as, at the moment, the corporate world. Um, so you moved out to the US to be an on-camera host and presenter. Uh, mm -hmm. which is your real passion, I understand. And yes. you want to place, uh, or was it on the BAFTA Newcomers Programme? So that's pretty hard to get into, right? Four-year programme. Tell me a little bit about that. It is. It was It was a really nice little milestone on my journey out here. It's a programme that's um, really designed to nurture new talent that have moved to the US and want to pursue a career on TV and film. So, so it's just a way to feel tapped into a community and to have a bit of a, a British presence in the States and, and blend the two worlds together. So I'm very excited to be on that. Fantastic. Uh, in the UK, you've been on all sorts of recognisable shows, Coronation Street, Emmerdale, EastEnders, even The Bodyguard, which was absolutely huge in the UK. And then in the US, since moving there, you've been on Netflix, on Uncoupled, and then more recently on the uh, ominously titled Dr. Death. <laughs> uh, and when you're not on camera, you are working for a private equity firm in Manhattan and doing executive coaching in the evenings. Is that right? I don't know how you have any time for any of that. Yeah, so the, the executive coaching is actually my own business. It's called Chrysalis & Co. And that's really something I feel very passionate about. I've been doing that for about a decade in different guises with different companies across different sectors and, and really working with people to help them fast track their careers through the power of communication and human connection. And if you've got any time left, you're writing scripts for TV. I don't know how you fit this in, JT. Where do you find these extra hours every day? It's the New York, it's the New York time zone. <laughs> you cram everything into a day on this side. It's amazing what you can get through in 24 hours. <laughs> Just don't sleep and you can get it all done. Well, Just don't sleep, exactly. I'm in sleep debt, but everything's fine. <laughs> okay, so, oh my goodness, so much that you're doing right now. Uh, mm -hmm. So many hats you're wearing, uh, so many achievements as well. Uh, I think people listening would love to know where it all started. So we're going to follow a general kind of format for these interviews where we talk about leading yourself, leading other people, and then leaving a lasting legacy. So we're going to test it out on you, if that's all right. You're going to be our guinea pig, JT. I'll be the guinea pig. You go for it. So to begin with, your dream. We'd love to hear about your dream. How did your dream come about? Did you, were you always going to be an actor? Were you always going to move to New York? Uh, was it a pretty straightforward process for you? Uh, no, no, and no, <laughs> in a nutshell. Okay. Um, I was not always going to be an actor. It, it really came about through just curiosity. I'm a very curious soul, and I was drawn to the world of entertainment, watching TV shows and reading books and watching films, and would really immerse myself into the stories that I was watching. And so the power of storytelling sat with me from a very young age, and it's something I felt very connected to. And as I got older, I just felt very inspired to want to create stories and share share other people's stories, whether it's as an on-camera presenter or TV host, as they say out here, whether it's through the art form of acting, writing for TV, podcasting, so many different avenues that one can go down. So for me, it's just about the power of human connection through the art form of storytelling. That's great. So That's drawing those amazing. stories and experiences out of other people and, and knowing mm. quite... Oh, the pressure's on me then, isn't it, to, to do, do a good job? Uh, yes. And did it, so you started, presumably you started 
were you watching TV as a kid or something and you just saw something and thought, wow, I could do that's a job. I could do that job. Uh, well, I don't know if I saw it as a job. I saw myself having fun talking into my hairbrush every morning as a microphone, watching breakfast TV and interviewing my imaginary audience. Oh, yes. uh, I felt very connected to watching certain TV presenters do what they did. And I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. It's so fun and engaging and like covering a such a range of topics. And it's a very nuanced conversation to really peel back the layers for the people's stories and put them in the spotlight. So that's what I was very drawn to. I was definitely not somebody who wanted to be on camera with the spotlight on me. Mm -hmm. That really was not the zone that I was in. Uh, so it's ironic I found myself acting because clearly it's a different side of the camera. But uh, yeah, I think life happens and I've just learned to go with the flow of what works and, and, and just really go in those directions to a point. Yeah. And what? so tell me, tell me about the steps. So did you train as an actor? Did you meet an actor and they took you under their wing how did you how did you even break into the, oh, the industry that's a really good question so this is really funny actually I found my moment of uh the light bulb moment the epiphany happened in a dementia care home where I used to work <laughs> dementia uh, that's it's where every Hollywood star begins their life in a dementia yeah. care home in a dementia care home okay. uh, I, I was working in a dementia care home and my office was actually in the lounge and I was surrounded by dementia residents who were absolutely adorable <laughs> but they 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 see things and they can't connect through the ordinary spoken word so it's all about you know eye contact and warmth and expression and empathy and really connecting beyond words and that's where I felt again the power of storytelling could be in so many different shapes and forms but the human connection element is where that happened and I was remember being burnt out in this role and one of the matrons, as they called them back then, she said, why are you doing this? You're so young and the, you're so vibrant. And this is really, you know, not the, not the right setting to help you flourish. There must be other things you'd like to do. What about presenting? You're really good at communication. And when she said that, it just reminded me of what my younger self wanted to be. And I thought, actually, that would be good. And life is short. Looking at the people around me, mm. I have aspirations. <laughs> 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 they haven't you know got what I mean? I know what you mean, though. They were in the last, you know they were in the final stages of life. And yeah. Thought, and, what would, when and, I get to where they are, yes. what, what do I want it to achieve? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get I it. came out wrong, but you know what I mean. I know you mean. Uh, and so I just I thought, yeah, life is short and, and I'm going to just try and, and not be afraid to fail. So that's what I did. I just did samples of free work and got experience and then started to book a commercial here, a commercial there, a modeling job here, a, a little acting job there. And then I thought, OK, if I'm going to be credible in this industry, I do need to get some proper training mm. and I need to understand what I'm doing a bit more. So I went to drama school. So I did it all in the wrong order. Oh, you, did like. do drama, so you went to drama school as well? Yeah, I did it. I did it quite late in life. I was probably the oldest person in my drama school class, which was fun. <laughs> uh, but I, I had, I, I did what I had to do. It wasn't the approach I probably would have chosen ordinarily, but I also recognised there's a place for drama school training, and to be doing what I'm doing, it did help to have a foundation under my feet to move forward with. So, okay, and that's amazing. And what have you learned about yourself in the process? Presumably. There were times when you required a real inner strength and resilience and grit. Mm. Can you tell us a story or a moment when things got really difficult and you thought, oh my goodness, where, where do I go from here? <laughs> Which one do you want, Darren? There are so many. <laughs> but... well, tell us about New York. So you, you're in New York. Was that, mm. uh, was it all set up for you? Did your agent sort it? Did you turn up to a nice furnished apartment? What was that like? Oh, come on. No. <laughs> I don't know what planet we're living in, but no, that's not that's not how it worked. I I came out here from the minute I left London, actually, at the airport, I was trying to check in to move here and mm. uh, they wouldn't let me check in because the address where I was staying fell through because the Airbnbs all had to cancel their bookings due to some loophole with tax or something. So until I had an address, I couldn't board the plane. And it was about one in the morning in England and I had to phone a friend in Canada say I don't know anybody in the States like how do I do this and she had friends in Manhattan who were very happy to put me up for a few days so God bless them because without them I don't think so you were at, you were there at the airport emigrating yeah. effectively moving your whole life mm. and you suddenly find out you've got nowhere to sleep that night when you go when you get there yeah I was homeless before I even started <laughs> okay, really good. and that was really not the plan so I arrived in Manhattan staying with a couple I'd never met before thank goodness they were lovely people but you know most people say that you burn out at about six months in New York but you just melt down 
And for me, it was about six days. Okay, two, six <laughs> it was, days, isn't it? It was a lot. Everything just happened all at the same time. You know, the, the hotels and Airbnbs were not, were not an option. The UN convention was so much. I mean, everything was booked out. Oh, it's a bit like on a Bethlehem at Christmas. So you've got... Oh, my goodness. Everything's booked up for the UN. Everything. Yeah. And you, okay. I couldn't even get a hostel. Couldn't get anything. And then it was super hot and had all this winter gear. But yeah, I was, it was like so, so hot in September for some reason. And then I realized September is quite a warm month in New York. Okay. And then there was a noise. And I, I know New York is noisy, but it, it really took me a while to adapt to the noise situation. Okay, I'm going to picture you. So you're dressed up like an Eskimo. It's uh, boiling hot. You've got nowhere to live. So this is the glamorous start. And presumably after that, it was a bit smooth sailing, was it? And you just got an apartment. Uh, no, not really. It took a while. Okay, no, still not good. Okay, right. Still trying to find my way around the metro. I can't say that's been easy for me. Navigation is not my strength. Okay. <laughs> of all the places to get lost, New York was definitely fun to figure out. Um, and then, you know, sadly, I lost my grandfather a month into my move. Oh, so that see. really, you know, had an impact on me emotionally. And I felt the impulse to want to go back to England and, and visit family. Oh, so you felt that India. pull to kind of, okay, maybe I've maybe this is the wrong time. Or you had every excuse, as it were. Well, go back. not to move back, but I felt the impulse to at least visit my family in that situation. Okay. But I had to work in India, so I was trying to time the dates so I could actually get back in so time. Now you're in India, months. so you've got yeah, then I was in India, and then New York, <laughs> India. Then I and then I missed the funeral. Ended up back in the UK and the US. Sorry, and then and then there's just lots of movement. I, I booked a TV job back in England in January, so then I came back, and then COVID landed in about February, March, and then everything shut down, and I just got a job in a restaurant to try and earn some money really quickly doing whatever until the acting stuff could pick up because mm. uh, you know it takes time to get a team around you to get representation with agents and managers so I had all that going on working in a restaurant to try and get some immediate income the budget I came with got blown up to, to smithereens because the prices were just way higher than I remembered mm. and um, yeah it was it was a, like firefighting for the first few months and then when the COVID situation happened I ended up in Vegas for about three months. Okay, so now we're in Vegas. So you've got UK, <laughs> a little back to India, in the UK, yeah. sorry, New York again, and yeah. then and then COVID hits. So you're you're just started getting finding your feet and maybe starting to book some jobs and stuff, acting jobs, and then COVID hits and you're you're on your <gasps> own. Are you a single female at this point, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true as well. Yeah, that was that was fun. Yeah. So you're figuring all this out every day, getting up, thinking, what problems am I going to solve today? And mm -hmm. how did you end up in Vegas? What's that about? Well, uh, I, I didn't even see it coming, to be honest. I had everything set up in my apartment, my hand gel, my toilet rolls, all the things that people do during that situation. I was mentally ready, I felt. And then I had some cousins who had some best friends in Vegas who were very sweet and insisted I come and stay with them. I didn't have any summer clothes for Vegas because, of course, I got all the winter gear. So still I'm in your going, Eskimo outfit, right? Still in my Eskimo clothes and I'm saying goodbye to the New York skyline. And I felt very emotionally confused. And I'm surprised. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know if I was coming or going, quite honestly, Darren. Mm -hmm. And one minute I'm on the East Coast. A few hours later, I'm on the West kind of desert type, not coast, but you know what I mean, desert. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> navigating things like scorpions and, and extreme heat and that kind of thing. And living with a family of, a lovely family, but a family that's really big with loads of pets, a whole menagerie of pets and teenage daughters. And and it was just a very different some kind of like Las Vegas zoo now with like... <laughs> Wild it animals. wasn't quite a zoo, Walking but it was. <laughs> it was. It couldn't be more extreme on the spectrum of where I was to where I ended up. And this doesn't sound know, like a normal career path. I have to say, this is <laughs> zigzagging around a little bit. <laughs> it was. It was a bit of all sorts. So you know, it took some some agility and some recalibration. Got into my flow, and then once once things opened up on this side, I came back. And then, of course, um, as as life would have it, I booked a job in England for, for Coronation Street. So right. then I. So, so I'm trying to keep up here. So you've got UK, you've got New York, India, Las Vegas, back in New York, ready to set up. Right. And then you book a job in the UK. So then what happens? So then I had about three days to make a decision. And and then that decision meant I'd have to commit to quarantining as well. Mm. So I it meant I would have to basically sell everything because there was nowhere to really store stuff out here. All oh, the right. storage you units to, were taken. So you'd already got all the stuff, you'd furnished, you'd kind of nested. Yeah. And then yeah. all that went and you'd start from scratch again. Well, yeah, because there was nowhere to, to store anything. Everybody was flocking out of New York and New Jersey, so there were no storage units. And the cost of storing it anywhere else would have been more than what the furniture was worth. 
So I was just wheeling and dealing to the customers at the restaurant and oh, selling so you, stuff. Was, you were like, so like, would you like a, you know, chest of drawers with your starter, sir? That exactly. Sort of thing. Do you want a sofa with your starter? Yes, You please. want a sofa with your starter? <laughs> and you cleared yeah. everything again. So that's, again, like, it keeps, you keep having to press reset. Yes. Way. Yeah. And then, and then I took the job because during COVID as an actor, there weren't many jobs at all. So I, I didn't really feel that I wanted to turn it down. And mm. it was the show that I'd grown up watching. So it was something to have on my CV that I would have really liked to have the TV credit for. So I went to the UK with a plan to go back to my London apartment that had been rented out. The guy didn't leave when I got there. So I couldn't quarantine in my own home over there. It, I ended up in an Airbnb for three months or something, just under three months. And so I'm paying through lots of rent. I had my Jersey rent, my uh, my London home, where the guy stopped paying me the rent. And then I was in an Airbnb. And I just thought, this makes no sense. So, you know, as soon as I did the job and I sorted out the apartment, I came back to Jersey and I thought, you know what? I just need to do it all again. And wow. so I did. So this was like the third or fourth time you've had to start over? Pretty much, yeah. Gosh. And what, you know, we're talking about leading yourself. What? Where did you get the, you know, resources and resilience to keep to keep trying and starting again, to keep restarting? Ah, uh, well, as I say out loud, it just sounds a bit ridiculous, my life. I just relate to you. I mean, it sounds a bit frenetic, I have to say. I'm just wrapping my head around what happened there. Um, the resources. Well, I, luckily, I, I do have a faith, and that really got tested during those times. Mm. But I'm so grateful that I was able to lean on that. that. That carried me through, if I'm honest. And then the kindness of people. I mean, the family in Vegas... The way they opened up their home to me, they didn't have to do that. And it was so sweet. They just treated me yeah. like one of the family. And then the kindness of other people that I didn't really know out here. And, you know, between the US and the UK and everywhere in between, I just felt like I met some really amazing people that just happened to be placed on my path at the right time. And then I guess personal experiences before I moved out here really helped me in mm. terms of resilience and the isolation and the loneliness and all of that. That was a big thing for me to deal with. And so the isolation, the loneliness, mm. that's that's a big deal, right? You, and I don't think there's any loneliness quite like being in a big city all by yourself, I suppose. Were there uh, any moments where you really kind of thought, do you know what, maybe I've made a mistake, maybe I just need to go home? Or were you always, you know, <sighs> fixed on that? <laughs> yeah, for a long time I was in two camps. The idea of going back home wasn't really an option for me. I felt like I'd, I'd started this journey and for better or worse, I was going to see it through. Mm. Um, that's not to say that there's not wisdom in knowing when to call it a day, but I didn't feel like I'd hit that threshold at that point. You, I thought everyone's in this together, whether you're in the UK or the US, you're still in COVID land and everyone's dealing with uncertainty and volatility and whatever it is. Uh, but for me, it was really important to to really commit to this, to what I'd started and, and just for better, for worse. Commitment that you made to yourself. Yeah. Yes. So that's a little bit about your story, your journey and your dream. What about mm -hmm. when you've been a part of other people's dream and their journey? Can you tell us a bit about leading others and what you've learned as a leader? Sure. Yeah, I think leadership comes in different shapes and styles. And in most organisations, we're used to seeing a top-down approach where it's more of a command and control centre. Leaders at the top, workforce at the bottom, and what they say at the top tends to filter through to, to all the different levels. And that may have been more more relevant to a workforce that was very male in its a positional in its leadership where you have a time yeah. and that's where your power comes from yeah hierarchical and, and that kind of thing I think a lot of women I know and me as a woman as well we don't typically respond so well to that sort of leadership hmm. and with so many more women in the workplace I think it's important that we flex that style so if I was to lead I prefer what's called the servant style leadership where you're, you're almost flipping that model on its head and that the leader is at the bottom of the pyramid hmm. elevating up and, and empowering others to make decisions and to to share the the power across the organization to trust in your team mm. it takes time to obviously build that it's not overnight but to really have conversations around it's okay to fail sometimes there's lots of growth in failure and to be humble enough to apologize when you don't get it right as a leader because we don't always get it right to yeah. hold space for other, others to feel more seen and feel heard so holding space that's a phrase i have heard i wouldn't say that i particularly know what that means what does it mean to mm. you to me it means psychological safety how does that person feel comfortable opening up and being vulnerable because if you've got a leader who's going to use that against them almost well that's not going to make them, somebody feel very safe if you're trying to create a supportive foundation for someone to to connect on a human level 
Mm. And to almost be seen as a person before they're seen as an employee or a colleague or anything else, helping them feel that it's okay to to have moments of vulnerability to to feel they can they can share what's what's going on, you know, what's really going on beneath the surface. So EQ is a really important part of the conversation actively listening and and power in the pause there's so much power in a pause power we don't have pause, to fill the that. silence mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's something we reference a lot in coaching but you the silence doesn't have to be filled in fact if you leave the silence it's amazing what can be offered up that you might not have got out of the conversation otherwise mm -hmm. so it's about seeing the whole person not just the surface level of what's what's going on but what's yeah. what's not being shared i think that's really true i mean gone are the days when you can just going to work tell someone what to do and then they do it i think these days you have to be a bit more nuanced and rounded that's great and mm. you mentioned humility earlier um for me humility and honesty a couple of things i mentioned in my, in my book uh which are traits and characteristics for long haul leadership so mm. i do believe that integrity is important as a leader what about you what do you think the secrets to being a leader over the long term we've talked about some of the um intensity of that early stage for you mm. but you now uh, you know you're you were, you're you're wearing many different hats over a longer period of time so what's the secret to keeping on going when you feel like you're tired and you want to give up oh yeah we all have those moments believe me um it's to really feel remember the purpose and have purpose driven leadership hmm. and to understand the responsibilities that go with that and the privilege that goes with being a leader not everybody gets to lead in this world and so whenever when you are in that position to take responsibilities and treat them with integrity to have good values that align with who you are and what you're trying to get across through your leadership style what kind of values and character traits do you look for in a leader then when you're, well, when you're being led that's, that's a really good question i i look for actions not just words mm. i look for somebody who embodies the things they're trying to share with their team are they just saying it or are they actually doing it mm. that's really important are they somebody who throws their team under the bus or do they have their back? And when I say have their back, I'm not saying, you know, let them do what they want and, and then just take ownership of it. But I'm saying, how do you how do you protect your team with integrity so that they feel safe to make mistakes? Because they are going to make mistakes. People, we're human beings. And it's about perfection. I'm sorry, not perfection. That's the opposite of what it is. It's about connection. <laughs> connection <laughs> not yeah. perfection. Yeah, it's about connection, not perfection. And that's something nice. I'm very passionate about because there can be a lot of pressure to as a leader and as somebody being led and if you're being led by the wrong person it can be very frustrating because you're not being seen you're not being heard you're not being able to shine in a way that you can really add value to, to a company or to a team mm -hmm. so yeah I look for um my dad was a great role model you know he was somebody who was a businessman he, he became a businessman more later in his life but for me he has integrity he's not ruthless he's humble He's hardworking. He has a great, solid work ethic. And that's really inspired me and in how I go about things. He mm. took risks in his career, which I think I've definitely done as the same. He even tried to move to the States, but I, I, I did so, that gosh, So there's some, there's some threads there in that he tried to move as well. And, and you're yeah. following in those footsteps. I am. I am. But there are lots of great business leaders out there. But for me, my dad was was not your typical leader. He's, he's a soft character but he has strength in, in areas where it really matters and so he has that lovely blend of empathy and connection but he's also got business acumen and commercial awareness mm. so yeah. are there any female role models that you've look up to maybe in the in the industry or oh in the industry um or outside of industry any that you feel like a, you emulate as a leader or have something to offer yeah there's several uh female leaders that i think of i think of the queen you know regardless of what Her people's match. views are the like, yeah. Match, yeah. regardless of what people think of the view their views are of the royal family i think the queen in her day especially when she came onto the throne you know to, to lead in that environment she was in so that young era. as well wasn't she she, she was, was so just a teenager. young yeah. she was newly married she she mm. had children she was trying to navigate motherhood being a wife being a yeah. woman in a very male world dealing with you know so much so much in her decades of leadership and the, her commitment and sense of duty and that that less is more style about her it was never she never came across like somebody who made it all about her it was it was all about service she and again that servant she style. definitely led with her values didn't she she, she, she did, was someone who faith. believed you know there'll be people listening who don't like the royal, royals that's fine but but one thing you can say about her is she seems to live out a life of service as you say mm -hmm. and she seems to live from her values from her faith but also yes. from from what she believed about um duty uh, yes. and, and 
and serving others. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then within the industry, I think people like Eva Longoria, she's, she's a role model for me. Mm. I think somebody doing what she's doing now, she's made a directional debut and uh, yeah, Flaming Hop, if you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic film. But I went to the Q&A and heard her talk about what she had to do to get that film to happen. And the 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 way she approached it was very different. Being a woman, being being from a minority background, she knew that there were certain okay. pressures on her that others might not have had Fighting to deal to with. to get those doors open or just to get a job yes. in, yeah. in what can be potentially, I'm, I'm guessing, quite closed off industries. Absolutely. You have to know the right people and look right and yeah. sound right. That's incredible, isn't it? So that she, she Eva Langora, made, effectively made space, made a way where there where there wasn't one before. She blazed the trail, and then others mm -hmm. can look to her and think, "Well, oh, gosh, if she's done it, then maybe I can." Any other inspirations for you or, or role models? Uh, yeah, I look at Reese Witherspoon with her Hello Sunshine production company. You know, having a production company is definitely a dream of mine at some point down the road. And mm -hmm. you know, seeing her and Margot Robbie and what they're both doing in that space and how they've had to approach it. Margaret Robbie, she's the Barbie lady. Yes, <laughs> I don't know if she'd like to be called the Barbie lady. Sorry, I don't want to call it. I'm talented, typecast there, but she was the one who had a lot of success. But she helped produce yeah. that film, didn't she, as well? She did, she did. And I just think it's great to see so many women coming through as producers, not not just actors. And you've got Nicole Kidman. and you, There's just so many great... And there's older role models now. There's older women in the arts and the industry. You've got Michelle Yeoh getting the Oscars last year. And it's great to see a place for older women in our industry from minority backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Are there enough? Absolutely not. Can there be more? Yes. But I think we're, we're making a start and moving in the right direction finally. So that's good. So those are some of the, um, the women in your industry who have been leaders and have blazed a trail. I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of the you can't be what you can't see phrase that when you see it, then you, you, you kind of have permission to do it and others follow. Uh, what about um, ethnicity? So those who are listening can't tell, but you're British, but you're Indian heritage. Um, so what about that space? Have you seen many role models there? Mm. Uh, that's been a harder space to find role models, I would say. I think there are a few names that come to mind in the world of TV presenting and acting and that kind of thing. But it could definitely be a bigger pool. And I think in the UK, we have people like Anita Rani, but we don't have many mainstream Indian TV presenters in the UK. I think there's mm. lots of news anchors and that kind of thing. Or, you know, people doing the weather. I feel that there's definitely a gap that's missing on mainstream TV, lifestyle, chat shows, that kind of thing. Um, in the US, I think there's one or two names that come to mind, like Padma Lakshmi, for example. She has a lot of food shows and that kind of thing. But again, I, I think there's a real gap of B British Indian women. And being in the States is a little bit different because they probably have other types of Indian women out here, like American Indian women and yeah, all, yeah. all sorts of things. But we could definitely blend more together and, and be more in the mainstream mix. Um, I think of people outside of the show business side more than anything. When I think of role models, I think of people like Amal Clooney, who I think is doing great work out there. She has the balance of celebrity and substance. I think that's really important. Malala Yousafzai, I think, is doing fantastic yeah. things and is a great role model for empowering young girls and women with education and that kind of thing and turning her trauma into something really like a treasure for, for women and young girls around the world. Mm. So they're the people that I feel more inspired by in, in that sense to do what I'm doing. Okay. And what about those coming up? after you so one of the phrases that we use in the podcast is there's no success without succession so mm. what what's key what's the key to a lasting contribution as a leader how do you raise up others or, or what's your belief about that oh it's, that's a great question and one image actually comes to mind and i don't know the phrase exactly but there's a, a picture of a a woman who gets to the top and there are two types of women there'll be one who pulls the ladder up with her and the other one who leaves it down for the next person to climb up I'd like to think I'm in the latter because to me that would make me feel much more fulfilled with what I'm doing with my life and the legacy I'm trying to create, trying to just help somebody else have a role model that might not have had one like I didn't when I was growing up. I think it's important to to do what you can to contribute to society and to share your wisdom and your experience if anybody wants access to that. Mm. Um, and to, to, yeah, to, to help others shine. I'm, I'm very big on creativity and I feel very stifled if I can't spread my wings and if I'm limited and restricted and it just crushes my soul mm -hmm. so to be able to help others showcase their talent is really important to me in whatever way I can I can do that so if you, when you have your chat show or your production company you can make sure you're giving those opportunities to to those coming after you I, I, I would like to think so so yes reminds me of the Hamilton thing where they would only allow people from certain 
minority backgrounds to actually play cast roles and mm. it just creates this space where you're 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 creating opportunities for people who perhaps didn't fit didn't look right didn't sound right in other spheres and then there's this huge broadway production uh, and you know that was kind of gives them a foot in the door so it sounds like a it similar does. thing well, for me, I also want it to be about the best person for the job. I don't want it to really be about anything else. I think it should be about the best person for the job and everything else should be secondary in an ideal world. It shouldn't come into play. But I true. just want everyone to have equal opportunities for yeah. those roles. But it's the opportunities, to, I guess, to train in the first place because to become exactly. the best person for the job, there's you have a, have access run, to a lot of rungs on the ladder before that. Absolutely. And if the, yes. if the doors are closed for those lower rungs, let's say, um yeah. you know then yeah whether it be finance yeah. whether it's about okay. access to opportunities access to opportunities that's great so one thing with your listening to your story is that you've obviously taken some big risks you single solo female you've moved to the states you've kind of slept on couches and stuff while you pulled it together um, and then you've you've made a success of it. You've worked hard and hustled, I guess is the word. But you know, there's a, there's a an interesting dynamic there between taking risks and then not having kind of regrets. And people could mm. say, my goodness, she's so reckless. She's she's like packed up and she's bounced all over the world. And you know, for you, how do you how do you kind of square that circle of taking the right risks uh, so that you don't have those regrets one day? Because I can see you're quite a driven person. You know what you want. But, mm. you know, there's not necessarily an obvious path to where you want to get to. No, absolutely right. Um, I think it's about, like I said earlier, passion. For me, passion is my compass. If I'm feeling passionate about something, I pay attention to that. And that tells me I'm, I'm going in the right direction. Because then you will you will do the hard work. You will sacrifice. And, and you, you know what you're doing it for. There's more purpose behind it. There is a balance to be had between being reckless and, and taking risks and that kind of thing. And and making some sense of sensibility around what you're doing. Um, for me, it's about calculated risk. It's about how do I do what I'm doing, knowing there's an element of risk and uncertainty and possibilities of failure and all of that, but being accountable for my decisions, taking responsibility for that, and knowing that I've got enough resources within me to, to redirect my advances in other areas. Is that the right word? No, not advances. Redirect my attention into other avenues if something doesn't work out, can I be resourceful? Can I be agile? Can I pick myself up and go again? Mm. Can I reset and recalibrate? Can I deal with rejection? Because these are all things that will happen to, to anybody trying to get to where they're going. It's very rare people get there first time. And like I said, I think having solid work, work ethic is really important and having that mindset. And, and for me, like I said, having faith. Having a faith is priceless. I'm so grateful for that because there's no way I would have lasted this long out here without it so yeah I don't know if that answers your question yeah I think so uh, and we're coming into land now so one thing we ask everyone is what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given as a leader ah, so many nuggets of wisdom have been given to me one is never stop learning yeah, you can always good. learn and that's where the humility piece comes in yeah the second thing is that rejection is redirection if Whoa. something's not working out come on now come on let me hear that again Re rejection <laughs> is rejection redirection is re well let's say rejection is god's redirection Good. that that's where i picked it up from it was it was a faith thing but it applies to the business space as well for me because mm -hmm. when things don't work out it's receiving that and it's hard because you, you have a vision of what you want as a leader but some things don't go to plan so it's okay how do i redirect that now where it's, it makes it's, this speaks into the failure thing about you know failure is just part of the course it's not something yes. everything's going wrong it's just it can move you into a different different path. That's right. And and know your audience. Like I said earlier, we have a, a different demographic now in the workplace. We have multi-generational work demographics. We have, you know, so many different uh, types of people now that, that are in the workspace. So it's about how do we flex our communication style, our leadership style, to really see and acknowledge the, the bigger picture of, of mm. who makes up the teams. Um, just so we can get the best out of people. Mm. I think it's really important to see the person and not the problem, which as a leader can be hard to do sometimes. Yeah, that's really good. So what's next for you? What's the next project? What's coming out mm. next? Where can we be looking for Jyoti Patel? Oh, my goodness me. Right. So, well, there's the podcast. That's a, that's a nice new yeah. project. Tune I'm in. Someday, you. I'm, you're, you're in yeah, the right someday place, I'm yeah. a podcast. I am trying to finish off a sitcom. I've been trying to write 
for about a year now. I'm at the the last stage of that, but that will be fun. It's uh, I'm not going to spoil it, but yeah, it, don't it's don't fun. give it away. Someone will nick it. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. going to be fun. And what else am I trying to do? I'm trying to think about the production side of things. I think given my skill set and what I do in my day to day life and coining, you know, corporate creativity how i can blend those two together. drop that in the last couple of minutes what's corporate yeah. creativity? <laughs> it's really the essence of what i do I think everything begins with a c it's so funny corporate corporate creativity my company's chrysalis and co communication mm -hmm. there just seems to be a thing with with blending those worlds together to build a bridge between those two spheres is really important for me and that's something i hope i can build on with my own production company one day so, and where, uh, where can we where can yeah. we find you? Are you online, social media? Do you have a website? If someone wanted to connect um, with you, yes, I have all of the above. I'm not I'm not great at social media, but I am on Instagram as Jodie Patel underscore actor underscore presenter. Couldn't think of a catchier handle. So if anybody That'll has do the speech, trick, let me know. It says, <laughs> that's what it says on the tin. Okay, uh, you know. And then there's my website jodiepatel.com. I have my executive coaching website, which is chrysalis and co us. Don't even go there. We'll stick, it in, the notes. We'll stick it in the notes. Don't worry about spelling. <laughs> but there's it. a method of madness there. Yeah, okay. The, the chrysalis, for anyone who doesn't know, is a process of transformation from a this caterpillar. This is the caterpillar thing. Flag. That kind of crazy. Yeah, it's about spreading your wings, which is very much what I'm about. Yeah. Good. And um, what else? I'm on LinkedIn and that kind of thing. So, yeah, wherever you can find me, I'll try to respond. Wonderful. Well, we're really, really grateful for your time, really grateful for your insights. I wish you all the best. Look forward to seeing you in the next Hollywood movie or maybe on the chat show. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and of course you'll be here for the for the next episode which is really exciting as well so thank you again for giving your time up finally a professional on the show uh, so uh, as you know um, the book The Plain Parable is out a lot of these questions are drawn from themes in The Plain Parable that's out literally right now as an audio book or you can grab the old fashioned paper copy on Amazon so other than that it just uh, leaves me to say thank you for joining us please do subscribe click follow do whatever it is that means you'll get a little notification share it with your friends and until next time remember to make someday today <laughs>